Hello and welcome to the Life Tools podcast. In school, we learned history and algebra, foreign languages and chemistry, but nobody taught us tools for life. How do we deal with self-doubt? What are beliefs and how do they influence us? How do we find ourselves when we feel lost? And how do we make a healthy decision? Many people learn these things much later in life, after three, four, even five decades of existence, and often the hard way. For a few, like myself, I had to learn them very early. I created this podcast to share with you the tools that have helped me greatly in my own life. They're small actions anybody can take that bring big results over time. Let's get to it. Hello everyone, I'm so happy to be back on this podcast. I was gone for two weeks, but it feels to me like two months, which is a good sign, I should say. We're still on the parenting series. The previous full-length episode was on the word good and how we use it with children, and after that was a mini-episode where I mentioned inner child work. I want to say a bit about these two before we move on to today's topic. Some of you might have found the examples in episode 20 a bit exaggerated. Just because we encourage a child to be blindly obedient doesn't mean we are screwing them up for life. If this is what you were thinking, I totally agree with you. After all, a child's primary caregivers are not the only influence in their life. There are other influences. Teachers, the changing culture, social media, the books they read, the people they meet, their own personalities, etc. My sister and I, for example, we are only a year apart, had pretty much the same childhood. We were subjected to the same rules, but we turned out very differently. So it is true, and it's a very good thing, that a child's primary caregivers are not the only influence in their life. But we must remember that they remain a major influence. If a child is not heard at home, for example, if they are belittled and made to feel like a burden, they will carry this belief with them. If they are lucky, and let's hope they are lucky, they'll come across a book later that will change their view of themselves, or meet someone inspiring, or be helped by a caring teacher. But what if they don't? Or what if they do, but only really late in life? So what I'm trying to say here is to not underestimate the power of your words and your actions over a child. This is true for everyone in general, but especially if you work closely with children. Now, a quick word on inner child work, which is also called inner child healing. Whether you have children or not, or whether you work with children or not, inner child work will benefit you. Like I said, this is mainly for you. It's just that the good effects spill over into other parts of your life. So if you haven't looked it up, I encourage you once again to do so. So, on to this week's topic. We are talking about respect. What comes to mind when you hear this word? And who comes to mind? Think back to when you felt disrespected. Also, think back to when somebody told you, maybe angrily, that you didn't respect them. What was it about? And how did you feel about it? A quick search revealed these two dictionary definitions of respect as a noun. Number one, a deep feeling of admiration for someone or something elicited by their abilities, qualities, or achievements. So we can think of someone in our life we hold in high regard. That feeling we feel for that person is respect. Someone who comes to mind easily for me is one of my Chinese teachers, Mr. Ong, who, when I was in my early teens, believed in me more than I believed in myself. I was obsessed with learning Chinese at the time, and he gave me all the resources he had in his power to give. He taught with his heart, and to this day, remains an honest, kind man dedicated to his craft, and I have huge respect for him. The second definition is due regard for the feelings, wishes, and rights of others. I would also add choices. This means allowing other people to have their own feelings, choices, wishes, and rights, and being okay with it, meaning not making it mean anything bad about them. So if you allow someone to express their real opinion about something, but then later on you withdraw your love as a form of passive-aggressive punishment, that's not really respect. So now that we are clear on the definition of respect, let's look at how the word is actually used with children. I see this everywhere and I'm sure you do too. In fact, it's so common that many of us don't even think to question it. Here are a few very typical scenarios. We can change the details, but the essence remains the same. 1. 
Little Paul refuses to do his homework at the time Dad says he should do his homework. Dad flips out and says Paul doesn't respect him. 2. 11 year old Jenna, during a dinner conversation, expresses her disagreement with her parents' view that Catholicism is the only true religion in the world. Her parents then tell her she's a disrespectful and ungrateful child. 3. It's winter and Tess refuses to put her coat on. She has just spent the last 20 minutes running around the school playground and is therefore very warm. Mom or babysitter angrily says, No playtime for you when we get home because you were disrespectful. If you analyze how the word respect is used in these situations, it's actually being equated with the word obedience, not with a deep feeling of admiration, as is the first dictionary definition, and especially not due regard for the feelings, wishes, choices, and rights of others, as is the second definition. Basically, it's obey me unconditionally even when I, as the adult, am wrong, unreasonable, or only care about my perspective. Who exactly is being disrespectful to whom? Don't you find it interesting that we do things to children that we would never do to fellow adults? If we apply the same behavior to our colleagues or friends, they'd call us crazy and abusive and walk away forever. In a work meeting, for example, we know the importance of letting others express their ideas and opinions, but we don't give the same privilege to children. In business relationships, we consider the benefit for us and for the other party, but with children, it's all about us. Isn't this what we call a double standard? I think the reason we get away with doing this is because children are small and helpless and fully dependent on us when they're young, and not by choice, I should add. It's not fair to them. Respect is not obedience. It may come with obedience, but it is not in and of itself obedience. Because think about it. If you were threatened by someone with political power, you would very likely just do whatever they wanted. But would you feel respect for them? Quite the contrary. You would hate them. You would obey them just so you don't get in trouble. That obedience is not respect. It's self-protection. Also, Respect is not like juice that we can squeeze out of an orange by applying force. It is earned, and it is earned by showing respect towards people first, including children, because children are people. Another important thing to understand is that forcing a child to obey us by using threatening words and actions only instills fear in them. And what happens to a relationship that is built on fear? Children, like us, are humans. So to understand what fear does to them, all we have to do is think what fear does to us. Ask yourself these questions. When we fear someone, do we want to be close to them? Do we want to tell them what's really going on in our lives? Are they the people we confide in? Do we trust them? Do we miss them when they're away? The answer is pretty clear, isn't it? I believe all parents love their children. No parent ever wakes up and says, Today, I am going to intentionally screw up my child. But the problem is when we are not self-aware. And again, this doesn't just apply to parents, but to all adults. The problem is when we do things by default and we don't pause to question what effect they have on these little humans who are in the process of forming their picture of life, of the world, and most importantly, of themselves. We punish children because, well, that's what everybody does, right? We require complete and total obedience because, well, we as children also had to give complete and total obedience to adults. Have you ever heard of the term conscious parenting? Conscious parenting just means parenting with self-awareness. It doesn't mean perfect parenting. That doesn't exist. It means being willing to look at yourself, all parts of you, good and bad, and then consciously choosing in every moment, who do I want to be? What do I want to transmit to my child? What kind of relationship do I want to build? When my parents did this to me, how did it make me feel? Do I really want to do the same thing to my child? So, for example, since we are on the topic of respect, when a child doesn't do what we want them to do, and our first reaction is that we feel disrespected, we pause and ask ourselves, why am I asking the child to do this in the first place? What is behind this desire? Is it to boost my ego and to feel right? Or is it because I genuinely think it is for the child's well-being? And what if they choose their own way anyway? How is that okay and not okay? Why am I not okay with it? 
How can I carry out this conversation with my child while keeping in mind that they are their own person? How can I express my feelings and wishes while also respecting their feelings and wishes? I guess I just gave you the homework for this week. So just bring awareness to when you feel upset or angry at your child or at a child if you're not a parent, and then pause, breathe, and ask yourself the questions I mentioned or other similar ones depending on the context. That's it for this week. If you find value in the material in this podcast, I would be really grateful if you could leave it a five-star review or share it with people who might also benefit from it. Thank you for listening and have a great week ahead. Bye!